First Kings chapter number nineteen. Familiar passage. Preached on it an abundance of times. It's funny how strange, odd, unusual, how certain things in the the Bible can be the same passage but apply in a different way. It's funny how sometimes you can see certain things because you view it through different glasses. I'm glad that the Bible is a living book. Had this event not occurred the way that it occurred, I don't know that he'd have been ready. By the time he comes to 2 Kings chapter number 2, remember Elisha is in tow and following after him and he's getting ready to cross the Jordan and he's saying, just stay back, just stay back. And Elisha said, no, I'm going with you. And he said, well, what do you want from me, boy? And he said, I... I want a double portion of what you have. (laughs) Many people often think in that double portion means he wanted uh, the abundance to do double the amount of miracles. What he wanted was a double portion of what kept Elijah faithful to God during all that time. He saw something in that old man that made him want to follow after the same God that the old man followed. It would be one thing if you looked at the passage and you considered the fact that he's been by himself and then he's preached and then he's called down fire from heaven and you think all of that would be a great thing. But I think the key note is in chapter number 19. I think what Elisha saw in Elijah is found in chapter number 19. Look, if you will, please. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. He came to Beersheba that belongeth to Judah, left his servant there, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down under the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Brother Larry, take us to the throne room. Father, we come to you this morning, and uh, and always, Lord, we want to not take for granted being here, Lord, for the visitors that we have here. And then for our own ride, Lord, the, uh, being able to be in this church and the doors being open, we thank you for that. We don't want to take it for granted, Lord, your presence in this place ever, uh, Lord, uh, through song and through the talents that are that are lended to you to give you glory through song. We thank you for that, from the from the piano player and the, the instrumentalist to the the song leader to to our pastor, our preacher, our teacher. Uh, we thank you for it and thank you for what you've given us. And we've already come through an hour this morning, Lord, of teaching of the fear of God, fear of you, uh, Lord. And we come to the message for the day, this hour, and we want our ears to be open in the right way. The brothers already mentioned the double portion. <sighs> Lord, we want just a touch. That's all we want. To touch your garment even. God, just to get a draw of you. Oh, one more time. A fresh drink of water. And we'll thank you in the advance for that. I thank you, Lord, for the answered prayer through these days. Lord, we try to take it a day at a time. I really used to didn't know what that meant. But we're grateful, Lord, we're understanding more about that as we go on walking with you. Thank you for the great fellowship that we know that we have with you, the walk we have with you, our relationship as being saved sinners with you, what you've done for us and who you are to us. We're grateful for that. For without that, Lord, we couldn't stand in front of your word, your man, and hear the preaching and understand it. So thank you for the touch. I pray in that touch, Lord, ask, I pray you touch your man now. Be with him. We lift him up before you. 
We ask you, Lord, to use him in a mighty way. Open his mouth, give him liberty, and may your word have free course among us through the airwaves, Lord, those that are not able to be here would want to. I pray, God, for them, especially uh, in this hour. Thank you for all you're going to do. And we give you the glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Can I point out just a couple of things? I wonder if by the end of chapter number 19 where Elisha gets called... I wonder about the timing of how that transpired. I wonder if after he had called down fire from heaven and the rain came and so on and so forth, how many people were waiting in the wings because of Elijah's popularity? I wonder if there was a bunch of people, wanna, might even say wannabes, that might want to say, man, I wish I could do what Elijah did. I wonder if his approach to Elisha, who was plowing the last plowman with 12 yoke of oxen, meaning that there's 12 other individuals plowing double yokes of oxen, and he's coming along bringing up the rear. I wonder if his approach to the one that wound up following him would have been different had it not been for this experience. I wonder oftentimes what makes a real leader. Not all leaders are public. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you go back just a couple of chapters, you'll find out that when Elijah was dealing with this thing uh, concerning Ahab, you know what you'll find out? You'll find out that uh, Obadiah was there. The Bible says in verse chapter number 18 and verse number 3, Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house, and Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. So when Jezebel cut the prophets of the Lord off, Obadiah took a hundred of those prophets. He's secretly continuing to do what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't have a public ministry. Not everybody's in the limelight. Not everybody gets seen. Not everybody is known or appreciated for what they do. I guarantee you there's a hundred people that are grateful that they're not dead because of Obadiah. As a matter of fact, Elijah says, Hey, where in the cat hair were you at when I was up there doing this and that and the other? He said, Hey boss, I've been feeding 150 people that the Lord told me to take care of. Amen. Just doing a little thing along the way. Just those small things that really do make a huge difference. We've been able to go places and do some things and not be concerned about frailties, feebleness, things in life that may be frivolous to you like preparing meals because you've been very kind about helping us and taking care of certain things. Can I say this? Not everybody has a pulpit ministry. Not everybody is a public servant. It doesn't mean that everyone is not a servant. Amen. Sometimes they serve in their own way. Sometimes they do things that even though you may not know about it, it does not mean that it is any less important. Amen. The Bible doesn't say what those hundred men of God amounted to, but God had a reason to preserve them, and I'm be willing to bet you that they had, in fact, their own ministry. Who are they? They're nameless. They're nothing more than a number. And too often in the day and time in which we live, we're looking for mentors and looking for people, but we generally aspire to be like people who get public recognition. So few people are like a Mary that walks in and does what she could and then walks out with saying out without saying anything. So many of us think that popularity and publicity means that we're successful. It's not always the case. I wonder when I read back over this passage again, if there was something in the way he approached Elisha, that Elisha stopped being very wealthy, going to inherit his parents' farm, going to inherit all of those oxen, already doing extremely well. What caused Elisha when Elijah came by and threw his mantle on him and he said simply this, if it's God, follow me. And if it's not, you got a nice coat. What made him think, man, God's on that guy? I think we find the answer to that question in chapter number 19. The thing that we are the most afraid of. The thing that we despise the most is our own weaknesses, our own frailties, our own having to come to grips with. I think the reason God lets us get old is to recognize we are not the answer to every man's question. Amen. I think God lets us get old, which ain't for sissies, by the way. I think the reason He does is to bring us to an end of ourselves. We got a lot of old people.
people here. You young people should be grateful that there's still some old people around here that you can learn from, and respectfully so. Believe it or not, they're not all dumb as a box of rocks. And if the Lord tarries, you're going to be old too one day. And you're going to wish you had an Elijah in your life. You see, I don't think that Elijah's life or testimony is set forth just for preachers. I don't think it's set forth just for prophets. I don't think it is set forth just for individuals to have a public ministry. But I do want to point out a couple of things that behind the scenes there's some things this old man went through that caused him to have for another 10 years now somebody by his own free will to follow him and to meet his every need until the Lord comes down and picks him up in a fiery chariot. I think we find in chapter number 19... The secret to real success, dare I even say that, it's coming to the end of yourself. Amen. Who would have ever thought Elijah would need somebody to come and take care of him? Elijah was always the one taking care of everybody else. Elijah never needed anybody. Elijah could live by himself all alone for three and a half years by the brook, ravens feeding him, the brook giving him to drink. He didn't have to have fellowship. He didn't have to have recognition. Didn't have to have appreciation. Nothing. Just him and God and he was good. But something happened and the brook dried up. And he goes over and he takes the woman's biscuit and he had prepared that woman and the woman by faith did what God told her to do. Amen. And then the very boy that was going to die anyway died. And Elijah lays on the boy there and breathes life back into him and the Spirit of God comes back in there and by the end of that thing he goes down there and he says, Tell Obadiah, go down there and tell Ahab, guess who's back in town? And you find yourself in the passage there in chapter number 19 where he comes up there, or 18, and he says, Is it you that troubleth Israel? And he said, No, it's not me. Israel's in trouble because of you, king. Man, look at the boldness to tell a king that. I mean, that takes a lot of horsepower. You do realize that the Lord, all he had to do was take his hand off Elijah and that all the king had to do was say, I'm done with you. Call his guard who would have been close by and snuffed him out right there. I mean, the boldness is amazing. No, it's you that troubles them. And I'll tell you what, we're going to have a showdown at the OK Corral up here. And you know how the story goes. And they come up there on the mountaintop. I mean, Elijah's as bold as you could possibly be. Bold as a lion, we might say. Yep. And he comes down after seeing rainfall and how often we have found ourselves in the same position. Boy, it is easy to follow God when God's bringing the rain. Man, it's easy to follow God when the crops are growing. When the physical health is with us, when we're strong and when we have the nerve we did as a young man. Oh, it is so easy when the bills are paid and the hospital beds are not awaiting us. There's another side of God, but we don't want to get to know that side of God. And yet it is the side of God that gives us what we need to make us what God would have us to be. Amen. The Bible says that even God Himself learned things by the things that he suffered. Amen. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Follow with me. We'll just kind of walk through the passage here. He all of a sudden thinking in his mind, has it ever not gone the way you thought it was going to go? Yeah. Ever gone that way? Miss Barbara's like, yeah, a time or two. Yeah. Have you ever in your mind drawn up how it's going to go? Yeah. <laughs> And I know it's going to work out this way because in our mind we're kind of God. We kind of think, oh, this is how it's going to be. Oh, preacher, I'm just dreaming. You know, sometimes we're delusional in that dream. Because we think as if we're going to be able to control it, especially when it comes to other people. Oh, they're going to meet so-and-so. They're going to marry so-and-so. Then they meet some dare-do-well, jack-leg, good-for-nothing, rotten, sorry, dope-headed, stinking pinhead. And there goes that dream. That ship sailed. Help me, Jesus. Amen. And then it's like, well, okay, well, I'm going to change it. It's not like you can go back in your dream and fix that. Right? Oh, if I could. But all of a sudden, things don't work out. And 
In his mind, he has to be thinking. Otherwise, sometimes that expectation, that understanding, man, they're finally sending me a letter. Jezebel's been converted. What a blessing. That old bat finally got it right. Woo! Hallelujah! I mean, Elijah's thinking, we're going to have a revival meeting now. Ahab and Jezebel are going to throw a banquet in my honor. They're going to worship God. The priests are going to be restored. The temple's going to be refreshed. All that bad stuff. I mean, I'm positive in his mind. He's thinking, man, I brought the fire. The sermon has changed the world. And guess what? There was no change. It's like a Sunday morning in a Bible-believing Baptist church. You preach and you think, Woo! Man, that was good! And they're like... And I'm like, Man, that was straight from the Lord! And you're like, I'm going to be behind the Methodist today, man. You should know after you've been here a while, you just, well, just cancel lunch plans. You're safer to make them for later than you are to make them earlier. Unless you plan on getting up and leaving. And if you do, we're going to talk about you. It's going to be easier when we move over there. It'll be easier when we move over there because the building's bigger. But there ain't no balcony to hide in up there. You're going to be down here with all of us. And, and some of you, it's going to make your skin crawl because you've been hiding for years up there. Woo! All them wanted me to say that about you. I wouldn't do that, but that's what they wanted. You're going to be down here with us regular folks. You know, the ones that are closest to the other place. <laughs> oh, now wait a minute. You were all for it when I was getting on them. Now we switched it a little bit. It's kind of like, well, now, whoa, whoa. I thought you meant that we were the better of the two. No, you're closer to the other place than they are. Did I resurrect you now? You're back on my side. <laughs> I love the fact that God's prophets are human. Amen. They got supernatural power, but they got a heart that's human. And it hurts, and it breaks, and yes, it even gets, here we go, are you ready? Depressed, downtrodden, discouraged, disappointed, disillusioned. Just the prophet of God. How could a prophet of God who's hearing directly from God, how could that happen? But man, here's what I get out of that. If that can happen to a prophet of God who's going to come back in the tribulation and preach and lose his head and be raptured out of here, man, shouldn't I be careful? to lift myself above that and say, oh, that'll never happen to me. I'm one letter away. One phone call away. One statement away from Juniper Junction. My GPS is already set, waiting on that one thing to happen that doesn't fit with my perception, my expectation. That one thing, and I make a dead right turn, and I'm sitting under the juniper tree saying, It's enough. Let me die. I am no better than my forefathers. But it's those moments where God shows us and teaches us things that we would not otherwise be able to comprehend or learn. Amen. But there has to be an embracing of that. Amen. Not a breaking of that. A willingness to say, Lord, thank You for the storm. Might drown, but I'll drown with You. Thank you for the disease and thank you for the divorce and thank you for the things that we now... We didn't draw it up this way, Lord, but you know the detour you had me to take. I like the brook Cherith. I'd rather stay there. 
Can I say this about Elijah before I get too far gone? He ain't a people person. Elijah the Tishbite. He's from a, a little town called Tish. That's all you know about him. But if you were from a town called Tish, you wouldn't be a people person either. <laughs> Would you? Who are you? I'm Elijah the Tishbite. Oh, you're from Tish. <coughs> y yeah? Nice talking to you, man. See you later. <laughs> and then the Lord gives him a little message and says, Go tell the king it ain't going to rain no more. Lord, I mean, don't you want to give me some doctrinal deep truth or not? No. Lord, I mean, don't you want to give me dispensationalism? And don't you want me to show them how to rightly divide? And don't you want me to show them the doctrine of the deep and the blood-sucking angels of Jupiter? And don't you want me to show them the, the, the gap between 1-1 one, one and 1-2? One, oh, Lord, don't you want me to show them about this and that and the other and all that? No! I want you to tell them it ain't going to rain no more. And then get out of the way. Amen. That's hard to do. God's messenger goes and does what he's told to do, and the Lord said, now go hide yourself. You, Lord, you just called me to preach. I'm your prophet for the age. No, he didn't call Obadiah. He called Elijah. Tell him it's not going to rain, now go hide yourself. You know what I'd like to say first and foremost? Most of us don't mind the public, but we hate the hidden. Our idea of success is always being the front man. We don't realize that before Elijah ever got to be a front man, he'd been in the rears a long time. How long before the Lord ever called him out in the first place? You don't know, it don't say. But I guarantee you this, he ain't no sprout. He ain't no little bitty teenager. He's not a Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. He's not them. Probably an older fella. Hey, boy. Yes, sir. I'm calling you out. Oh, okay. What would you have me to do, Lord? Go tell the king it ain't going to rain no more. They'll fill in the blanks. He does, and then he disappears. And it don't bother him. He never complains about being by himself. He ain't a people person. The world is a great place sometimes. But there ain't nothing that can mess it up the world faster than people. Sure. Amen. Amen. Animals don't mess it up. Am I right? Birds don't mess it up. Fish don't mess it up unless you don't catch any when you're fishing. But people. The weather don't really mess it up. But people. Elijah said, oh, if I can deliver the message and get away from peeps, I'm good. See you later. He's by the brook Cherith in my mind's eye. It ain't no mud hole. I think it looks like one of them places, one of them beautiful lakes up there around Switzerland. Beautiful mountains and, and streams and snow covered. And I'm, I'm, I'm painted how I want to paint it. You paint it when you preach it. You make it a mud hole if you want to. I don't think it's a mud hole. I think it's crystal clear. I think you run your hand through it and you don't even know you got, you think it's air, that water so clear. I mean, isn't it like God to always provide the best? I think. That's what I think. I don't think the ravens brought him little pieces of bread. I, thought they, I think they brought him prime rib and ribeye. Probably not any pork. I understand that. He didn't get bacon for breakfast. I understand that. That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> I think he ate really well. I think God took really good care of him. I think when he put his head down at night listening to that Babylon book run, I think he was like, man. And the Lord said, let me tuck you in. Make a burrito out of you. You ever done that? There ain't nothing like when you're sick and your wife comes along and she tucks you in like when you were a little baby. Oh, you guys, y'all are y'all like, oh, not me, you know. <laughs> okay, I take it. Tuck me in so I don't get cold. <laughs> we make little burritos for babies, right? I mean, you can fix them where they can't move, man. I mean, they're, they're in there. That's our, we call it a burrito, but it's really torture. But at any rate, I think the Lord tucked him in every night. Can you imagine? Every night the moon's light is dancing off of that crystal clear river and Elijah's thinking, man, the Lord said, see that star up there? Yeah, I spoke that into existence. Man, he gets to talking to Elijah and Elijah, 
He's trying to stay awake, but he can't. Sandman's done been to visit, and he can't. He can't hardly keep his eyes open. And every night he falls asleep to the sound of the Lord's voice. Amen. 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 Wakes up the next morning, and the Lord said, "We got something new for breakfast this morning. Something different. You probably never tasted this before." So why don't let it do it however you want. I don't think it was mundane. I think Elijah had to be, I think the brook had to drive up to get dry up to make him go. Amen. That's why the Lord dried up the brook. It's kind of like, if I don't dry up the brook, he ain't leaving. Right. <laughs> the blessing of a dry brook. But that's another sermon. You don't want me to preach that one and then this one. So let me get back on track. And he goes and he delivers the message. And he calls down fire and he sees the rain fall. Because of what he optically perceives, because of what he is able to deduce on his, in his own mind, everything is good now because all he thought they needed was rain and they'd turn back to God. He had it all figured out. <laughs> Once they get the rain, how can they deny God? That ever happened to you before? Oh, hey, once they see this, you get a message, somebody gives you something, a track or whatever, and you're like, oh, if I could just give them this, man, they could see that. I mean, there's no doubt. They're in. And they look at it and they're like, are you a nut? Is there something wrong with you? Why does that guy yell so much? Who is that? What are you? Preachers don't talk that way. And now you're like, I thought it was going to be a blessing, and now it's not so much. Well, guess what happens? He delivers the message and the rain falls. And the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Coming to the end of the chapter there, he girds up his loins and he outruns the chariot back to the city. He gets to that city thinking, how can they deny the presence and the power of God now? And sure enough, in a couple of days, he gets a letter. And in his mind, he's like, this, this cannot be anything but good news. Can I say this to you? He's living right. He's doing everything that he should do. He's in perfect obedience. He has preached the message exactly what he was told to preach. The way he was told to preach it, he didn't leave any of it out. So his mind is, Israel's going to be saved, man. We're, we're back on the right track. God is going to be glorified. When He gets it before He opens it, He's already drawn how He thinks it's going to be. knew she was a crackhead, but I didn't know that bad. <laughs> she got to be smoking crack. What do you mean you're going to kill the one that brought you rain? What do you mean you're going to kill the one that's provided for you? What do you mean the one that has rejoined you as a nation back to the God that you had turned your back on, got your reprieve? What do you mean you're going to kill me? Of all people, you're going to kill me? Look in the mirror, Jesse. You, something's wrong with you. Put the pipe down. And the first one to get that is his servant. And his servant sees by the countenance of his face, he's like, uh, not good news, boss. Uh, no. Matter of fact, uh, she said she's going to make me like one of those we killed over there by Kidron. That boy starts making packing right then. He's packing his bags. He's getting ready to get out. He's figuring, well, if they're going to come get you, I'm out of here. <laughs> he gets to the edge of the wilderness where he gets there. He don't have to ask twice for the boy to go. He's like, okay, well, nice seeing you. Got to go now. Because it didn't work out the way he drew it up. Can I get close to home for a second? Come on. When you got married, 
Did you plan for divorce? Come on, preacher. Woo! Some of you all of a sudden quit praying and went like, whoa, did he just say that in church? Yeah. I don't think you're second class. Yeah. Sometimes you're better at the do-over than you were in the beginning. I'm serious. You're sure a lot more gracious. Hallelujah. That's good preaching. I know you never happened to you. I know, but you didn't plan for that. Did you? It didn't work out like you drew it up. Right. Did it? And God didn't give you what you thought He promised you. God never promised him. He did what he was supposed to do. But guess what? He said, I'm going to kill you. Elijah being the good Baptist that he is, he left. That's a guy who's faced 850 prophets total of Baal. Who stood in front of all of Israel and proclaim the word of the Lord. And he got a letter for a queen with a thread in it. And his first answer to that is, I quit. Yep. Yes, sir. Didn't go how I thought. Well, wait a minute. I just, <laughs> just a chapter before. You're in the perfect will of God. How do you go from being in the perfect will of God? How do you go from there to being, I'm done. I'm through. I'm out. I quit. How's that happen to a great man of God? You know what he said? The Bible said he packed up his stuff. And he left and he went to the edge of the wilderness. Can I say, number one, you need God's hand on you because there are never-ending situations that occur that will always test you. And the first temptation is, I Quit. Amen. Why? Because God promised you something that didn't happen. You're, you're an exception to the rule. Why, why is that? I can tell you why your expectation was. That's not what happens to other people. We, the people we preach about. But it don't happen to me. Right, sir. God better not ever do that to me. I'm out of here. Do you ever think that maybe the devil is trying to get you out of where you need to be and that what you need to do when those things happen is hunker down, bow your neck, and lean into it? But when it comes to spiritual things, aren't we quick to say, I'm done. We didn't do that at work. We don't quit working because somebody's not happy. Oh, we quit church though. Come on, preacher. Preacher. You ain't reading my Bible. I ain't praying. God's like, oh, oh, please don't quit reading your Bible. I don't know what I'll do in heaven, Gabriel. What do we do when Christians quit reading their Bible? Oh, Gabriel, is there any hope for us? Will heaven ever get full at this rate? What are we going to do? That doesn't even cross his mind. Right, amen. Let me hurry along. He goes, and here's the second thing that happens. He wants to be by himself. This time, it's not because the Lord told him to be. This time, he's fixing to have a pity party. Can I say, when you get in this situation, being by yourself ain't a good place to be. Right. You fixing to do something stupid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't mean to be too plain for you. I'm just saying, when you abandon everything and everybody around you, you better be careful because there is somebody with you and it ain't always the Lord. There's somebody right there in that room, right there with you, talking to you at the same time. Hey, when Eve got alone and was over there staring at the tree, it was not God that showed up or Adam that showed up. It was the devil that showed up. And the devil said, I don't blame you, sugar, for being upset. He put you down. He's not letting you be what you could be. You can be as God's. God's robbing you. <coughs> you shall not surely die. Oh, being alone in a condition like that is a bad place to be in. Bad place to be in. 
Elijah now begins to cut ties. Get rid of the servant. You know what that means? He's gotten rid of all of his possessions. He ain't planning on being around. He doesn't have anything except what he can carry. Are you with me so far? He's going out in the wilderness. What? He has no possessions. He has no promise of possessions. He has no promise of water or victuals or food or nothing. He has no promise of any of that. He ain't planning on needing it. Are you hearing me? Because sometimes suicide is not just physical. Sometimes it's spiritual where you cut yourself off from everything that God's in. And all of a sudden you don't care about the bread of life. You don't care about the water of life. Before long, you'll be right down there in the mire with Jeremiah and having no bread and having no water and having no fellowship in complete darkness and mired down. And the more you wiggle, the more you're stuck. Amen. Amen. God deserted me. Well, hang on. I'm going to get you out of the pit in just a minute. I'm trying to give you a mindset of a man who had walked with God and talked with God, been chosen by God, had had God's hand on him. I'm trying to give you that if it can happen to a man that has that greatness in him, should we not be very, very, very cautious? Amen. Amen. I can almost understand him being upset with the entourage being what it was. A whole nation of Israel... I understand Moses saying, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book. Why? That's like a million and a half just men, not counting women and children. Which, by the way, when he led them out, there were mountains on both sides. You knew that, right? There was the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them. That's Exodus 14 if you want to look it up. He knew when he led them out that there was only one direction that they could go and it was the Red Sea. And guess what? At that time, he didn't promise them it was going to be parted. He knew what needed to be done. Right. Say, so what could they do? The only thing you do in a situation like that, he had to... Amen. Lord's Red Sea in front of me. Mountains on either side, Pharaoh's army pressing down behind me. Which way? Up. Amen. Let's get him under the juniper tree. I see him. I see his heart broken like an egg under a giant's heel. I see him grieved. I see him depressed beyond depression, not just because of a lack of results, but because the entire nation of Israel has not seen God's hand. His heart is broken. He's not being a brat. He's truly, sincerely disturbed. He figures, you know what? If after all of that, they don't turn, what's the point of me even being here? I see him. Small steps, one at a time. The servants already beat feet out of there. And the sun's banging down on that old bald head. And those sandal-covered feet and the sand's in there between his toes and between them sandals. The flying teeth are getting on him. It's 100 degrees in the shade. And he's just walking. He don't even know where he's walking to. He just... Walking, thinking, left alone with his thoughts. Oh man, such a bad place to be. I'm no good. I'm worthless. God didn't use me. God doesn't want me. If God loved me, He'd have blessed me. I don't know why this happened to me. There's no point in even being around. I ain't got no wife. I don't have no children. I don't have no grandkids. I've got no possessions. 
All I've ever done is want to follow the Lord. And ha, look what it got me. This crack-headed woman's trying to kill me now. You ever been there? Sure. Amen. Amen. Even with all that you have. Right. Yes, sir. You ever been there? Oh, yeah. He goes over there and looks off in the distance. The only shady spot there is Juniper Junction. He figures as good a place as any to die. He's at the end of his rope. Crawls up underneath that juniper tree and pulls his knees to his chest. Little old bony arms gather up like a little ball in the fetal position. And he's so dehydrated and dried out he can't even shed a tear anymore. He's in a hard spot. He's shivering now. The sunburn is beginning to take effect. The night air is beginning to come along. The animals are beginning to close in on him and they're howling and the hyenas are laughing at him. The lions and the bears are fighting over who's going to get him and he just sits there and trembles and shakes. He doesn't know how or when it's going to happen. He's not going to do it by his own hand, but he's begging God to kill him and he figures death is soon. Pretty desperate situation. Amen. Could I just remind you, this is God's prophet. He is the preacher in the Old Testament. Amen. He is the man. He's the one and only one that God sends His own personal chauffeur-driven limousine to pick Him up and bring Him to the house. It's the same guy. He don't look like it right now. Oh, what made Him so great? The time He spent in the desert under the juniper tree. Amen. He's cried his last tear now. He doesn't cry it out. He goes to sleep thinking, I won't wake up. I'll face the Lord when I get there. The rustle in the bushes. And it's a lion. Only it's not the kind that eats you. It's the same one that will show up in the lion's den with Daniel. Amen. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Amen. And as the animals begin to close in, that lion steps on the scene and horrified and terror-stricken, those animals begin to back up. We, we, we were just checking it out. We were so sorry, sir. And all he does is look at him, and he sees that old guy laying there. I think knowing him, he takes off his cloak, covers him up. Amen. Why disturb a baby when they're sleeping? Right. There's nowhere to go. You know what it says to me? One of the things he needed was just some rest. Yes. Amen. He just needed a little rest. While he's asleep in there, he goes over and kindles a fire. I don't know where he got it, but the Bible said he made biscuits. Cathead Alabama biscuits. <laughs> See, the Bible don't say biscuits. The trilateral root word in the Hebrew. <laughs> when you say bread to a southern boy, that is not interpreted loaf bread. That's cathead. Right. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Amen. And a cruise of water. Why? Because sometimes we act out of character because we're dehydrated. When you turn off the spigot from the spiritual things before long, you can be dried up spiritually so much so that it affects you physically. Amen. 
Because you turned off the fountain of life. Isn't it amazing how the Lord lets you control the spigot? I mean, isn't that strange? He, he's the fountain of life, right? The wellspring of life, right? That, that what He is? Ain't it funny how we turn that thing off or cut it back a little bit? It's a little too much. Let's not leave Him laying there. Because right now, you know what He's thinking? He's going to die. You ever been there? He wakes up. And he wakes up with what he went to sleep with. You ever done that? <laughs> you know that when you wake up, things ain't changed while you were sleeping. That's right. Yeah. Amen. You felt good while you're sleeping because you were anesthetized. Right? You didn't know nothing. And then you wake up and it's like, oh yeah. That's right. Welcome to life. <sighs> Again? Yeah, same thing, different day. <coughs> Bear with me. Are, are you getting his mind? He's not calling Elisha. He's not thinking about doing another 10 years of ministry. He went to bed going, This is it. I'm done. And God goes, Good. T time for me to get started. <laughs> Amen. I've been waiting to hear that for three and a half years. Yeah. Woo! Gabriel, we're going to have revival. Hey, Michael! Yes, sir, Lord. Want me to go dig up somebody else? Nope. But I thought we was going to have to. And he looked across there and that crackling fire's burning. And you see the sparks when that logs pop and sparks go up into the night sky. And over that smoky smell, smells like cracker barrel on a cold day. <laughs> and even though you smell the smoke of the fireplace, you can smell them biscuits cooking. Yes, sir. And the lady walks by you and she's got a tray full of biscuits. <laughs> and you know what she says to you? She says, now while your meal's coming, would you like some biscuits? <laughs> and you're thinking, man... I'm carnivore. I can't eat no biscuit. Don't go to Cracker Barrel if you're carnivore. You're going to cheat. Put your piece of ham in there or something, you know, to kind of... And he looks there, lots of butter. And you squeeze it, it runs down your elbow. He's expecting a death sentence. And instead, the Lord is there to impart life. Amen. Right when he thought it was over, it was just getting started. Amen. 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 The worst time in his life winds up being the best time yes. in his life. Oh, if you were to ask him, Elijah... You walked with God. You did all these miracles and called down fire from heaven and the Lord sent His chariot to pick you up. What was the greatest thing? I dare say none of us would even dare bring up that moment of depression. That's one of those things you don't talk about. Right? Elijah, was it this? Was it this? Was it this? Elijah said, no. Was it when you crossed the brook? When you saw Elisha? He had, no. Was it when you raised the little boy back to life again? No. The birds feeding you and the water coming out of the roof? No. Okay, well, what in the cat here was it? He said it was at my lowest time. It was at my worst time that it became to be the best time. It was the worst of times. But it was the best of times. Praise the Lord. Oh, he, he came down there and just me and him, there seemed to be something that connected I'd never seen. I didn't see it on the mountaintop and when the fire fell and the rain came. I never saw it by the brook Cherif. I never saw it in the ravens. I never saw it in the preaching. I saw it under the juniper tree. Amen. 
when I was defeated Amen. by discouragement and by depression, and I was ready to face death, I figured I'm no good. And I opened up my eyes and I looked and right over there in the corner, the Lord's got a log there. And I propped myself up on it and I can't already believe what I'm seeing. And I keep clearing my eyes out and I keep looking. And the Lord simply said to me, are you thirsty, boy? And I said, yes, sir, I'm real thirsty, but there ain't no brook here. He said, no, but there's a cruise of water. <clears throat> Something that I can refill for you Amen. anytime you need a refill. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Are you hungry? Yes, sir, been a while. Because you know, depression sometimes steal your appetite. Things just don't taste good. You just don't care. You say, why? When you're depressed, your mind is such that you, you, you're, you're like somebody in the last stages of life. They begin to lose their appetite. You say, why? I'm checking out. Nothing tastes good. You want a candy bar? No. You want some biscuits? Eh. Steak? Nah. What you want? Nothing. Some biscuits. You sit there a while. I think probably one of the greatest things was is while he's sitting there, he missed the fellowship around the table. See, what I missed in the passage was this. It wasn't just the provision that the Lord's pointing out to me in that passage. He's saying to Elijah, Hey, son, what you missed while you're doing all this stuff for me is you left me. Oh me and you need this personal time. Even if I got to get you out under the juniper tree to get it. Amen. 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 That's good. He said, You left your first love, son. Yeah. Mm. You forgot the builder and maker, the one that called you and made you and empowered you. See, I miss that. I'm going, I'm thinking, man, there's water. I could preach on water for a while. And there's a cloak for getting a covering. And there's fire for warmth and for light. And there's the, uh, the bread that's there for the food and protection. And I got all those kinds of things. And the Lord's like, yeah. But you're missing the most important thing. Yes. Right. It's that personal time. Amen. Amen. You say one-on-one -on -one time. It ain't you on the mountain. I'm using you like a pipe running through a wall to get water out. That ain't helping you, boy. It's a personal time. Yes. That boy's about to pop. He looks like a puppy has got his head stuck in puppy chow. His belly is swole up, man. He's laid over and he can't hardly breathe. Probably wasn't gluten-free biscuits or something. I don't know. His eyes are getting heavy. The Lord says, why don't you... Why don't you take a nap? Yeah. I was looking when I went back over at about 4.30 this morning. I'm running back over everything, Brother Larry, and I'm, 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 I must have missed where the Lord's spanking him. Where the Lord's getting on to him. Come on, preacher. Where the Lord's straightening him out and giving him a little word of instruction. Amen. You know what the Lord did? Just spent time with him. Amen. 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 Fed him. Yes, watered him. <clears throat> watched him. Amen. He's come enough to life now, realized that that is not going to happen anymore. So he's now he kind of gets worse, skin for skin, all the man hath to give for his life is what the Bible says. And so now all of a sudden it's kind of like, oh, well, I'd like to go to sleep, Lord, but all these animals closing in around me. And he said, don't worry about that. Who do you think watched over you when you were by the brook Cherith, son? Amen. 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 The only water and hole in town, every wild animal that could be, was surrounding you all the time. How is it you didn't get it up? Amen. 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 Oh, you mean you were doing it? I mean, I was doing that. I mean, I was taking care of your protection the whole time I was feeding you. He goes back to sleep. This time when he wakes up, it wasn't like he woke up the first time. Right. Amen. This time he wakes up and he wonders to himself, I know I'm full, and I don't think I'm dreaming. 
But I sure hope I wake up with that mindset than the one I had before. Yes. Amen. And he wakes up right across the fire. There's the Lord sitting there. Morning, he says. Elijah says, morning. Are you still here? He says, yeah, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Lord. Even though you messed up, Amen. I didn't drop you. Amen. I didn't quit. Amen. Man, I got so many things for you to do. Lord, I'm such a failure and I'm no good. That's not even in the passage. The pressure of unfulfilled expectations. Well, you know what happens? The Lord says, I like the Lord. He must be Southern because He knows there's like three things that are majorly important. Food, water, and sleep. I mean, that's we're still that way, right? The Lord says, you hungry? The meal I gave you a while back is not going to be enough to sustain you for where you're going. You need to keep eating. You thirsty? One drink's not going to quench your thirst. You need to keep drinking. Have you learned anything under the juniper tree? I've learned I need you. Okay, good. You know what? You're ready for the journey now. They have a little conversation there by the man cave. I've got to close out, although I'd like to stay a while. You say, why? If you were to go, Brother Mitch, down there to Juniper Junction, come on by, old man. If you were to go there, you know what? You'd see my initials there. I've been there. You're a preacher. Got a good church and good people. I've been there. Amen, amen. You look there, you know what you see? D L P underlined. Yeah. I got hash marks yeah. after it because I've been there more than once. Elijah only went once. I upped him on more than one occasion. And I got into where I am starting to learn it's not such a bad place. Because <laughs> sometimes it's being driven to the depths of despair Amen. that makes me realize I've been trying to handle too many things on my own and I wasn't that I needed food and water and I needed the fellowship Amen. that I get underneath the juniper tree. Amen. Sir. And the Lord's like, hey, you remember this, don't you? I'm like, oh. Lord? That's how Buck says it. Lord, I'll never forget this lesson. And the Lord looks back at the angels and goes, yeah, right. I'd like to say this, my trips there are less frequent. Amen, amen. But I'd also like to say this. My trips there have been most memorable. Amen. Not because of what drove me there, but who I met yes. when I got there. Amen. Who helped me Amen. when no one else oh, that's right. could help me. That's right. Right. No one ever. Amen. Cared for me like, yeah, like right. Jesus. Amen. It's a fact of life. I look at that and I think to myself, man, if a great man like that can get in that situation, this is how I say it to me hey, boy, you better watch it. Yes. Yes. But I know this, if you're a Christian, and I'm done, there's no tombstones right outside of Juniper Junction. There's plenty of tombstones outside the pig pen. Every brodical don't make it back. There's a lot of tombstones outside there. There ain't no tombstones there at Juniper Junction. You say, why? The worst time can be the best time. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
And it can be the time where you get restored and you go on for 10 more years. And after 10 more years, you've got somebody to step in and the Lord says, hey, you ready to go to the house? Lord, I've been ready since Juniper Junction. And now you know when he walked by and he said, if it's God, follow me. And if it isn't, you got your night. He's like, there's something about that old man. It wasn't his miracles. It was who he was hooked up with. You could see God on that man. That boy's like, man, what is on you, old man? I don't know if it's God. Follow me. Something's on you. Hey, preacher, I'll be with you in a minute. I need to kill my oxen, burn my plowshare, say goodbye to mom and daddy. I'm coming. Why? Something's different about you. It wasn't Cherith. It was Juniper Junction. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And preached a message along these lines in a place where I was up north a couple of years ago. There was a young boy that was there. Joni, come to the piano if you would, please. And the young boy was there, and I really, I didn't know because I, I wasn't sure when I was preaching it why the Lord just was, He pulled me off of what I was saying, and I, I started going down this theme of depression and, and so on and so forth, and I'm, and I'm preaching the stuff. And, and when I got finished preaching the thing and got finished with the service, the young boy was sitting there, and I said, I don't know why I was preaching on that subject. And he pulled his collar away from his neck. And he said, I do, preacher. I said, why? What happened to you? And he said, just a couple of days ago, he said, I tried to hang myself. I've done some bad things. I'm headed to prison. I figured the best thing for me to do is to get out. He goes, I know why you preach it, preacher. He said, because I got saved tonight knowing that God's not done with me yet. And God was merciful to me to let me escape what would normally have brought death. Christian, can I say this to you? I know that there are a number of us at times that go through spiritual valleys, not just physical dilemmas. God's waiting on you under the juniper tree. He's aware of that. He knows about it. He understands he made you. He knows that we're feeble and frail as dust. Sometimes one of the greatest things to do is to do as some of these have already done this morning and just crawl up under the juniper tree and say, Lord, it's enough. I can't go any further. I can't do any more. I'm, I'm done, Lord. you got to help me. I can assure you, I can speak my personal testimony. There'll be a cruise of water there. There'll be some biscuits there. There'll be some protection there, but let me just tell you, it's not the place, it's the person. And He's there. And if you're there, He can help you. Why don't you come? She's going to play.